Thank you. So the title of my talk is Emergent Symmetries in Multiple Phases. And I'm going to be talking about a few results, thoughts, and speculations about various aspects involving in multiple phases, which I shouldn't mention, I should introduce yesterday. So this is joint work originally with Suche Wei at Stony Brook, now largely with Juan Wong from Harvard. And the results I'm going to be presenting are partly presented in this paper, which is already published. Back. Another one which is in preparation and will be out soon. Before I start my talk, I'd like to say a few words about what is motivating me to think, or think about these things. A few questions that I like to think about and I'm interested in are, why do some phases have exotic boundaries? What is exotic about exotic boundaries? How are fermionic phases different from bosonic ones? Uh, and what are the effects of unbroken global symmetries in various quantum phases? More broadly, what are the global structures in this abstract space of phases of matter that we have, which seems to have a lot of structure, and what exactly are these? So with this immodest set of goals, let me begin with something very concrete, what I think is a very illustrative and a simple example. So I'm considering a one-dimensional system whose Hilbert space is two-level systems, like qubits, on a one-dimensional lattice. And what I'm interested in is mapping out the phase diagram for this family of Hamiltonians. It has three pieces. The first is a very trivial paramagnet. Second is like an Ising coupling, but it's slightly different. It couples Zs with every other side. So you can think of this as two decoupled ferromagnetic things. So they, the evens coupled to evens and odds coupled to odd. And finally, this Hamiltonian is called a cluster state Hamiltonian, which was discovered in the context of measurement-based quantum computation, uh, but now is understood to have a very interesting phase, which is what I'm going to be focusing on. Now, crucial to the story are the global symmetries of the system. The system has two distinct Ising global symmetries, which is isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2. This is obtained by flipping all spins on the even lattices and all spins on the odd lattice. So this is my global symmetry. And we can check that each of these symmetry generators square to one, and each of these generators commute with each other. So this uh, establishes that the symmetry is z2 cross z2. Now, it's very easy to understand that, even though the exact numbers, I don't know, but the topology of the phase diagram should be this. It's very easy to figure this out. So let's start off by setting beta to zero. What we obtain is just this part of the Hamiltonian, which is a very trivial Ising transition. But like I said, there are two distinct Ising chains. So the transition from here to here is two distinct Ising chains undergoing an Ising transition. So we have a paramagnet separated by a phase transition, the ferromagnet. On the other hand, we can set alpha to zero and then look at the transition from this trivial paramagnet when these, the sum over xi term is dominant with this part of the Hamiltonian. And this undergoes a very interesting so-called topological transition. Very interestingly, even though this, these two are distinct phases separated by phase transition, this thing is not a trivial paramagnet. And what distinguishes this from the trivial paramagnet is what I'm most interested in. Um, so to understand how this phase, which I'll call a cluster phase, because this Hamiltonian is called a cluster state Hamiltonian, is different from the trivial paramagnet, let's look deep into the phase, where we take this beta, larger than every other number in the problem, and then just we can then we can approximate the Hamiltonian to be just this, this, this Hamiltonian. So it turns out that this Hamiltonian is exactly solvable. You can find out the entire spectrum. Uh, in particular, we can find out its ground state. And if you consider periodic boundary conditions, this has a unique gapped ground state, which is obtained by starting with a simple product state of the plus one eigenvalue of the poly x operator, and then operating by a nearest neighbor two qubit entangling operator called the control Z gate, which is written in this way. So it has a very simple form. It entangles two qubits pairwise. However, if we consider an open boundary condition, it turns out that this ground state, which was unique, is now fourfold degenerate. And the various states in the ground space can be obtained by loosely choosing whatever you want on the boundary spins. So the, originally, the boundary spins were pinned, all the spins were pinned to the plus one eigenvalue of the poly X operator. Now you can choose it to be anything you want. And this spans the fourfold degenerate ground space. And this is a very generic feature of all so-called SPT phases. I'll define that more precisely in the second half of my talk, which is it has a unique ground state on any closed space manifold, and it's degenerate in open manifold. 
and this generalizes to all dimension. Um, to understand how these boundary modes arise, I'm going to follow a trick that I learned by listening to Ashwin Vishwanath in Boulder Summer School a few years back. Just if you actually write down the Hamiltonian with open boundary conditions, if I consider one particular symmetric boundary termination, starting with zero and ending with spin number n, let's say, we still continue to have the original z2 cross z2 symmetry. This is how I choose to terminate it, which is these e the Ising spin flip symmetries on even and odd sides. However, there's this new symmetry that appears only on the boundary. They can operate, you can check explicitly that these two operators also leave the Hamiltonian invariant, and these things arise only when you open up the Hamiltonian to open boundary conditions. While these two operators continue to square to identity like the original symmetry operators, it turns out that these guys no longer commute, rather they anti-commute. If you ask, what do these two generators, what group do these two generators generate? It turns out it's no longer Z2 cross Z2, but it's this interesting non-abelian group of eight elements called the dihedral group of eight elements, D8, which is called D8. So the original symmetry was Z2 cross Z2, and the symmetry that appears only on the boundary is this interesting thing called D8. And I claim that none of this is a coincidence. The original global symmetry, which is Z2 cross Z2, this new symmetry that appears on the boundary D8, and the phase of matter that the cluster state belongs to are all intimately connected. For example, you could ask me what other symmetry groups can arrive at the boundary. If I had a different, in, you know, more smarter termination, could I remove this? It turns out I can't, for example, generate D6. There are certain groups that can come out at the boundary, emergent symmetries that can come out on the boundary, which is very specifically tuned to the fact that of which phase of matter this belongs to, and some, switch, some of them which do not. So these three things are very intimately connected. Another way to rephrase this is D8 is a very specific, non-trivial, so-called central extension of Z2 cross Z2. Doesn't matter. And it turns out that the emergent qubit on each end, which gives us the boundary degeneracy, is a non-trivial, two-dimensional irreducible representation of D8. And this is precisely what leads to the four-fold degeneracy, constant degeneracy. Now, even more interestingly, let's remember that if I terminate the system on an interval, there are two ends, not one. So this is the first end, which is at zero, and the second end, which is at n. And these emergent symmetries appear both on the left and the right hand side, while each end independently generates this D8 group. If I consider the total boundary symmetry, which is the product of the left and the right end, which I'll call sigma x and sigma z, interestingly, this turns out to generate the original Z2 cross Z2 symmetry again and not D8. While these interesting non trivial symmetries turned, out, turned up at each end, if you consider both of them together, suddenly you recover your original symmetry. Once again, this is not a coincidence. This is precisely to do with the phase of matter it belongs to and the global symmetry we are considering. It. So let me give a little summary of this and then put this in a larger framework, which is what got me interested in this whole story. So each, like I said, each end forms a representation of D8, but both ends put together forms a representation of Z2 cross Z2. The, sometimes this is phrased as following. It's, it's said that the boundary symmetry is fractionalized on each end. And the original global symmetry is well-defined when we consider a pair of points, the pair of boundary points. And this can generalize to higher dimensions. So it turns out that there's this very nice paper by Dominic Kels and Chetan Nayak where they argue that the symmetry is realized in a very weird way on the boundary. And I'll just throw this jargon called anomaly. So the symmetry realization on the boundary is anomalous in a specific way, which is it, it's a well-defined representation of the original group only when you consider the boundary is to be closed. But if you open up the boundary, like consider a single point in one dimension or an interval in two or in higher dimensions, the symmetry is no longer a good representation of the original symmetry. There's something wrong that goes wrong. A surprising theorem that was proved last year by Wong, Wen, and Witten was that even in higher dimensions, this is surprising to me at least, even in higher dimensions, this anomalous realization of symmetry could be at, uh, uh, ascribed to the emergence of a larger symmetry than the original symmetry. And the phase of matter, which also determines the anomaly, boundary anomaly, the original global symmetry and the emergent symmetry are all intimately connected to each other, exactly like the way they were in one plus one dimension. Um, why were Wong, Wen, and Witten looking at this? It turns out this has something to do with this super interesting paper by Ashwin Ishwanath and Senthil uh, in 2013. So they were very aware of the fact that the effective description of the boundary, which means if we consider just the boundary to be a standalone lower dimensional system, the symmetry realization has some kind of an anomaly in it. 
provisionally, and it's a very good way of thinking about the anomaly, we can, provisionally we can define anomaly to be some kind of an obstruction to be able to re drive the system on just on the boundary to a trivial phase, which means if you consider the standalone theory on the boundary, and you ask whether you can uh, drive that system to a trivial phase, which means a unique ground state to, to some phase of the unique gap ground state, it turns out that it's not true if the thing is living on the boundary of a non-trivial topological phase. Now what Ashwin and Senthil realized was that a very powerful probe of the non-trivial nature of the bulk was by playing these games with the boundary, like trying to push the boundary to a symmetric phase, even if you could not push it to a trivial phase. So by pushing the boundary to a symmetric phase, which usually leads to leads to develop leads you to develop some kind of a non-trivial topological order, helps you study and classify the bulk. And they were able to discover new phases that were dropped out of the original classification scheme. What Wang Wen and Witten wanted to do was put this particular exercise, which is producing symmetric gap boundary conditions, in a systematic framework. And they were able to help characterize the anomaly very neatly in terms of these emergent symmetries and provide sort of an algorithm to construct symmetric preserving surface phases and also determine what the proximate phase transitions in the boundary are. So the algorithm is roughly as follows. Given the SPT phase, use your math skills and determine what the extended symmetry is in the, in the boundary, which soaks up the anomaly, so to speak. Dynamically gauge one of the subgroups of this larger symmetry to get back the original symmetry. So if G tilde is the larger symmetry that appears only on the boundary, dynamically gauge one of its subgroup K to get a K gauge theory with the original symmetry G acting on the anions, non-trivially and so on. And this is a good candidate for the surface symmetric theory with non-trivial topological order. This is very interesting stuff. Now, you could immediately ask what happens if we consider, so this entire story in turns out, including Wang Wen Witten's uh, result, is uh, specific to bosons. Like they were able to prove things explicitly for bosons using very hard mathematical. You could ask what happens for fermionic non-trivial phases, like if you ask the equivalent question for fermionic systems. So first of all, what changes with fermions? Now, when we have fermions, the Hilbert space is different from what we have with bosons. Even though, you know, creation and annihilation operators at a particular point appear seemingly local, they're really not. The creation operator at site number one anti-commutes <coughs> with the creation operator at site number 350,000. So if you, you can't add these creation and annihilation operators locally to produce a local Hamiltonian, you can only add operators in the Hamiltonian that are bilocal in fermion creation and annihilation operators. And this you can interpret as some kind of a symmetry called fermion parity. Now it's not a symmetry in my books because if there is a symmetry in my opinion, you should be able to explicitly break it and you cannot break fermion parity if you want to have your Hamiltonian be local. All global symmetries in condensed matter systems you're interested in has fermion parity because we're largely interested with fermions. But for physical reasons and reasons of observation, there's a particular assumption we always make about fermion parity which we never state explicitly. Which is all global symmetries in fermionic condensed matter systems contain fermion parity as its center. Meaning, if you have symmetries in the system, all symmetry generators commute with fermion parity. Now this is another way of saying that we do not expect rocks to have supersymmetry. If, if fermion parity indeed did not commute with other generate symmetry generators, that means that there are symmetry elements which changes an even fermion parity sector state to an odd fermion parity state, meaning it maps a boson to a fermion. And we generally assume that such things don't occur in magnetic systems, spins, and so on. For example, the conventional time reversal symmetry, which, where t squares, t squares to the fermion parity, is isomorphic to the group Z4, because if you raise the time reversal generator to fourth order, you get back the identity. However, here you should also be obs observe that fermion parity is at its center. You don't map even fermion parity states to odd fermion parity states. Now, let me give a, an illustrative example for fermions, just like I did with bosons. Uh, the Hilbert space I consider is that of spinless fermions on even sites, but now qubits on the odd side. So there's, it's a composite system with spins and fermions on the lattice. Now I'll choose, like it's, it's common, instead of using creation annihilation operator, I'm going to choose Majorana operators, which are Hermitian, square to identity, and distinct Majorana operators anti-commute. Now I'm going to be considering a model cons uh, which was written, you know, invented by Ashwin and uh, Nat. Uh, but I'm going to give a different presentation, which to my, for my purpose looks aesthetically nicer. So this is the model I'm going to be considering. Now observe that this is very similar to the cluster state Hamiltonian that I considered originally, 
instead of, but in between we have these fermion parity operators and fermion hopping operator, Majorana hopping operators that's just stuck in here. It turns out that in a very specific sense, this model is like the square root of this model. Meaning if I square this in a specific sense, I get this model. So this is a square root, which is an inherently fermionic non-trivial Hamiltonian. It's a square root of this one. And I'm going to be studying this. Now, this, what are the symmetries of this model? It has two symmetry generators. One is the fermion parity. We want to call it a symmetry. And the other one is time reversal symmetry, which is obtained by flipping all the spins and then complex conjugating everything. This is the symmetry. And these two put together, once again, they square to identity and then they commute with each other. So it's isomorphic to the original group that I was considering. You know, Z2 cross Z2, but it's anti-unitary and it's fermionic. Turns out that this thing also has a unique ground state. However, when we open up the boundary conditions, it turns out we can play the same game all over again. Uh, this thing has, once again, two new emergent symmetry generators. One is this just the fermion parity on the boundary, and there's another boundary version of time reversal symmetry. These two guys also square to identity, but Interestingly, on the boundary, these two don't commute with each other. So these two generators, once again, form a D8 group. But this is a fermionic symmetry, meaning that fermion parity does not suddenly commute with your time reversal symmetry generator. So what we find is that just on the boundary of this one-dimensional non-trivial fermionic SPT phase, there's some kind of a discrete and internal version of supersymmetry that appears on the boundary. So this is what replaces the bosonic story that I was talking about. And this symmetry is supersymmetric in the specific sense that it maps a state with fermion parity 1 to fermion parity minus 1. And my claim is this seems to be a generic feature of a large class of fermionic SPT phase. It, at the end of the talk, by, at the, at the end of the talk, I'll talk about where this applies and what the general picture might look like. So in our paper, we explicitly construct this boundary symmetry and talk a lot about a lot of features. We, uh, we describe a lot of features of various one-dimensional SPT phases. We can do this for every element of the Aldon Zimmer symmetric classes. And we can also show that this is true for inherently interacting one-dimensional fermionic phases and interacting versions of the Aldon Zimbauer members also. This is true for all of these examples. It's also true for higher dimensions. And in fact, the most canonical examples like the quantum spin hall insulator, the topological insulator, topological superconductors, all of these things have this some flavor of this emergent internal supersymmetry that appears when in higher dimensions. Um, so, what does this bias? This is some stuff in the works. So, recap that that the the reason Wang Wen and Witten were interested in studying these things was to write down explicit symmetry preserving surface terminations of non-trivial SPT phases. Um, so, how one can do this in the bosonic case is very interesting. So, what what Ashwin and Senthil did were they considered the boundary of something called bosonic topological insulators, which is the bosonic version of the same symmetry groups as that exists in the topological insulator. And they consider a particular starting point for the boundary, which is a superfluid with all the global symmetries. But the symmetries were realized in a very weird way. For example, the vortices in the boundary, they assumed transforms as a Kramer's doublet. Even though your original symmetry is Z2, the, this thing squares to the time reversal squares to minus 1. But this minus 1 can be absorbed by gauge transformation. So this is a projective realization of the original global symmetries on the vortices. They started off with that. And then by condensing a particular symmetric combination of this vortex components, the particle content with this original fermion, uh, so M particle, which is a Kramer's doublet, and the vortex of this particular condensate, you can write down a theory which is manifestly symmetric and has topological order as obtained by this uh, mutual Chern-Simons term. So you can write down an effective description for the boundary which is manifestly symmetric, has all the right properties, and has non-trivial topological order. And here we can actually see this extended symmetry story in, in, in action. The original symmetry was Z2, but since T square is minus 1, it acts as Z4. But this thing is gauged away. So G tilde is like Z4, K is Z2, and you get back the original symmetry. So since the symmetry is realized projectively, you, you, this is you know, going to a higher symmetry and then gauging part of its subgroup in, in, in action. Now, you could ask what the equivalent story is for fermionic surface termination. There are a lot of interesting work done on how you can have a surface termination which is symmetric for fermionic SPT phases. Now, the simplest surface termination for fermions, which is symmetric, that I know of, is this thing called the semion-fermion topological phase, which are discussed in many papers. 
One of them is Wong and Sentil. Um, this surface termination, I mean, this is a surface termination for time reversal symmetric topological superconductors. The particle content is very explicit. There are anions, Z4 anions, the anions of a Z4 gauge theory, meaning there are four electric and four magnetic particles, and all combinations, which means there are 16 anions. And there's a fundamental fermion because this is an inherently fermionic theory. And it turns out that time reversal acts in a very specific way. It, it takes one of these anions, vortices, which can trap a Majorana on a zero mode in the, in the core, the fermionic mode zero mode in the core, and it occupies it. So time reversal exchanges these vortices without fermions to vortices with fermions. And this is what, what I, I've been referring to so far. It's curious to, to see whether we can write down an effective field theory with this symmetry being manifest, and whether this biases anything new in terms of understanding the surface behavior and understanding what kind of interesting proximate phases exist. And I don't think such things have existed. Uh, so let me end in the last few minutes with sort of a big picture about where to place all of these things. Um, depending on your taste, you would like this or not. Sometimes I get complaints, so I put this at the end. I really like find this stuff very interesting because we can t say very general things about the space of all possible phases just out of pure thought. Um, so we are interested in finding out generalization also of this kind of phase, which is not this kind of a phase, meaning that we know, understand, and love Ginsburg Landau type spontaneous symmetry broken phase transitions phases, but these things fall out of that classification. So we want to focus on particularly on phases which do not, which fall out of the Ginsburg Landau framework. It turns out that if you want to consider only non Landau, which is non spontaneous symmetry breaking phases, and if you focus on only gap phases, there's a very technical tool that you can do to filter out all symmetry breaking phases, which is we consider in D dimensions only those phases which have a unique ground state on D spheres, which means a circle in one dimensions, a two sphere in two dimensions, three sphere in three dimensions, and so on. These all fall outside the Ginsburg Landau framework, which means you can prove, you can argue that if there is spontaneous symmetry breaking, it will have degenerate ground state on all these D spheres. Now there are two situations. One, you could ask if it has a unique ground state on D spheres, what about other closed manifolds? If the answer is that it has a unique ground state even on other manifolds, this is what I'll refer to and what Ashwin referred to as integer topological phases, sometimes also called invertible topological phases. And if it does not, it, these are generalizations of the fractional quantum Hall effect, so we can call them fractional topological phases or intrinsic topological phases. These integer topological phases are, are what I've been talking about all this time. It turns out that in a very specific sense, these integer topological phases have the structure of an abelian group, which means you can add and subtract them. So they have the structure of an abelian group, and this the binary operation is obtained by stacking one system on top of the other, take a phase system from, another, from one phase, another system for another phase, stack them, you get a third phase. So this gives you a binary operation. It turns out that these things, this thing is also invertible. The boundaries of these integer phases have some kind of an anomaly, which sometimes is called a gravitational toothed anomaly. Now, there's a lot that we can figure out just by playing mind games with asking what the effect of global symmetries are. So they have a very interesting global structure. The, the collection of phases, invertible phases, have a very interesting global structure. And we can figure this out explicitly by just trying to imagine, speculate what happens by explicitly breaking all these global symmetries. So I, I'm going to be using the blackboard for some, like, a little bit now. So let me assume that this is a set, and we call this as I of G. This is the set of all possible invertible gap phases with global symmetry G in D dimensions. This is some set and it has some elements. If we have a global symmetry, one thing you can do is explicitly break it, add perturbations to your Hamiltonian that does not commute with symmetry. So it turns out that if you consider the set of invertible phases with no global symmetry, it turns out that all of these things correspond to something here. So if you break symmetry, all invertible phases with global symmetry correspond to some invertible phase without global symmetry. It could be trivial. It's easy to argue that this map, this thing is always bigger because phases with symmetry are more than phases without symmetry. This map, it turns out, is subjective, which means that every element here has some pre-image over here. Every invertible phase could you could add some global symmetry to it, and then it will correspond to something over here. So it turns out that this map is surjective. So we have this interesting structure, 
Let me call this map as pi. The, this, this just corresponds to explicitly breaking symmetry. This is surjective. These guys are, class, are characterized, these things, we can actually say a lot about what classifies and characterizes these guys. So there's a special set over here, all of which map to the trivial element. Meaning that there, is, there are specific invertible phases with global symmetry, which where if you break global symmetry, it becomes completely trivial. And this is the kernel of this map. Let me give this a name, let me call this SPT phase. So it turns out that this structure, this has something called, a short, this, this forms something called a short exact sequence. This is injective, which means that this thing you can think of, this thing you can think of as a group that's injected here, and this thing is surjective over here. This thing forms a short exact sequence. Now I can actually make very precise about what this conjecture is. This thing over here cannot have symmetric boundary conditions. It cannot even, in fact even have a gap boundary condition. This is an example of this is, uh, the integer quantum Hall effect, like the example of this is the integer quantum Hall effect. If you explicitly break the U1 symmetry, you land up with something called a P plus IP superconductor, which has no global symmetries, but it is known that it has chiral boundary modes and you cannot have a symmetric gap termination of the boundary. This thing may or may not have, but to, uh, to ask the question of which phases can have symmetric boundary conditions, you look at the kernel of this map and you only focus on these guys, which become trivial completely if you explicitly break all global symmetries. So these things have something called, yeah, Gauge anomalies. This thing has something called gravitational anomalies. And my conjecture is that this interesting structure that comes out purely by speculating what happens by ex explicitly breaking global symmetry, the conjecture is that these things over here, which is invertible phases that become completely trivial in the absence of any global symmetries, are the ones which can have symmetric boundary termination, have these emergent symmetries, so on and so forth. This is the conjecture. The conjecture is a class, at least, of SPT phases can support symmetric surface terminations with emergent symmetries. Fermionic SPT phases can support symmetric surface terminations with emergent internal version of supersymmetries. To prove these statements is extremely hard. They require spectral sequences and complicated things, but hopefully examples are easy to find. I think they are. Effective descriptions are interesting to find. And hunting for interesting physics might be much easier than trying to prove any of these statements. I think it's very exciting. So I'll end with one last speculation, which is, you should remember that historically, these effective surface terminations came out of a different line of investigatory, different line of research, which is called this deconfined quantum critical criticality, which are these original non ginzburg landau outside of ginzburg landau phase transitions, which were systems which had symmetries and now, in the modern way, we can say that these symmetries are anomalous. These are lattice and internal symmetries, and they're combined in a particular way that forbids the existence of a trivial phase. And it was these, this technology that actually was ported to understanding surfaces of topological, bosonic topological insulators and superconductors. Now, if we play the game in reverse with fermionic systems, I think there's a possibility that there are these interesting deconfined quantum critical transitions in two dimensions, lower dimensions, that are inherent for fermionic systems. And these stories might help us investigate some of these novel phase transitions in lower dimensions that might have been ignored. This is just a speculation. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Can you uh, relate the supersymmetry that you are getting here to you know the space-time supersymmetry people talk about in quantum field theories? Um, you see some connections. I don't know. I've wondered about this. Uh, yeah, it actually, that's a very interesting question, and I did think a lot about this. It seems like these symmetries cannot be the space-time version because some of these generators, uh, you know, turn supersymmetric generators turn into spatial translations and so on. So at least if you want internal symmetry, it seems like you, you cannot escape the fact that you need a, a simply non-relativistic theory. So there are these uh, supersymmetric Chern-Simons theories where there are these gauge fields coupled to non-relativistic matter, 
where these symmetries are realized. I think it has to be one of those variants. Um, even if we consider lattice symmetries on an effective field theoretic level, it turns out to act like an internal symmetry, like deconfined quantum critical, the story of GD, deconfined quantum criticality. And I suspect that's the same thing that Lapanium for Fermion is here. So, it can't square to the translation operator, something like that. Yes. So it has to square to an intern, like some kind of an internal symmetry. We cannot have a relativistic system. So, hi, I'm sure. Um, so coming to that Hamiltonian that you showed, um, so you had three terms, right? And it kind of, the first two looked something like a transverse icing, am I right? You'd also mentioned um, these fractionalized bound states, again. If I just look at the transverse icing, in some sense, the best you can do is fermionize, and then you'll get these Majorana bound states. I just want to understand if that's what you mean, and once you put in the cluster component, is there something new and different that you get out? Um, I don't think so. The, if you jordan Wigner transform, so, so there's a, there are a collection of fermionic phases and a collection of uh, bosonic phases, and you could, in one plus one dimension, you could try to relate them by jordan Wigner transformation. Um, generally, the collection of fermionic phases are more than the collection of bosonic phases. For example, if we consider the, the one plus one dimensional Kitayal chain, and a jordan Wigner transformation, it becomes a symmetry broken phase in uh, the bosonic side. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. So I want to understand better what you are talking about. I didn't catch that. So, so the, this, the jordan Wigner transformation relates different phases, but there are some inherently fermionic SPT. Like this could be a fermionic bosonic, uh, bosonic fermionic SPT phase could or could not be related to a bosonic SPT phase under jordan Wigner transformation. Um, that's an independent statement from these, these things about emergent symmetries. If indeed jordan Wigner transformation related something on the bosonic side to a fermionic SPT, fermionic SPT on the fermion side, then they would independently have their own interesting boundary modes. But these statements are independent of what happens during the journey. So with that cluster term, do you get or? I think the cluster term just maps onto the Sushri for Heger model. Uh, you had mentioned that you you were assuming that there is no uh, that, that the fermion parity commutes with everything, but um, is, is that a if, if I relax that condition, which is very natural in many many more like for example, take any system which has odd number of Majoranas per unit cell, then fermion parity anti commutes with translation symmetry. Okay. Is if I so if I relax that condition for there are many. Uh, uh, in general, many and it's very natural to have supersymmetric um, symmetries. I mean, uh, supersymmetry is very normal with on-site Fermion parity or even particle holes. Sometimes can be supersymmetric. I relax it, you get something new, or is it just does it just maybe just extra degeneracy on the? That's the simplest thing that happens. It gives you degeneracy, but there's something much more. My, my, my guess is that when we consider these situations, like for example, particle hole symmetry that does not commute with fermion parity, so on and so forth, it brings us to this exactly the same setting. It's some kind of an anomalous symmetry realization, and I suspect there cannot be a unique ground state, and the phase transitions here are very interesting ones. And these are good candidate theories for boundaries of pretty phase. Come on, there's something more interesting. Boundary. Not sure. About. That's a very interesting question. <clears throat> Any more questions? Because if not, let's thank Abhishek. Uh, 